Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. World War II is perhaps one of the most popular settings for war drama films. It was a terrible conflict that engulfed half the known world. It was also perhaps one of the more clear-cut wars. No Russian mercenaries or Iranian proxy groups or other nonsense like we have nowadays. The good guys and bad guys are easy to identify. But it's still extremely difficult to translate war into a film because the truth about war is that war is always terrible and sometimes it's really boring as well. And oftentimes things are spiced up so that the film can do better at the box office. But what's the point of a war film, especially one that takes place during a real war like World War II? Is it irresponsible for audiences to consume these kind of movies as just entertainment? Aren't we obligated to learn something from these events? Aren't we supposed to figure out what truly happened, even if the truth is terrible or just not what we wanted to hear? Because in most cases, these aren't just stories made up by Hollywood. These are actual things that happened, lived through by actual men and women, many of whom made the ultimate sacrifice for their country or family. I think when you're trying to honor a hero or remember a villain by telling their story, the best way to go about it is by telling the truth. Don't embellish the story. Don't have any hidden agenda, even if that agenda is a positive or benign one. Because at the end of the day, these were traumatic events that happened in our history. And in order for us to learn from them, we have to see them unfiltered and uncensored. Which is why today we're going to go through five myths that we see in World War II films. Red Tails follows the accounts of the 332nd Fighter Group, otherwise known as the Tuskegee Airmen. What made the Tuskegee Airmen so special was the fact that they were the first African-American fighter group to serve in the U.S. military. These were brave young men who decided to fight for a country that still had extreme racial inequality, including segregation laws that separated colored and white people at all levels of society. Despite all this, the Tuskegee Airmen still served with distinction. They are mainly known for their exploits as long-range bomber escorts. The 332nd Fighter Group and their red-tailed P-51 Mustangs became one of the most recognizable and feared fighter groups in the European theater. Now this is a really amazing story as is, but for some reason the writer of Red Tails decided to embellish the story and therefore there are many inaccuracies in the movie, which takes away from the overall message I think. One thing the movie states that's false is that no bomber was ever lost when the Red Tails were escorting them. Now this is based off of a false story that was published by the Chicago Defender in 1945. A quick look at the combat record of the 332nd Fighter Group will tell you that this most likely was impossible. You see, the 332 Fighter Group flew almost 200 escort missions. With high casualty rate of bomber crews, it would be a complete miracle for them to not lose a single plane. In reality, the 332nd lost around 25 to 27 bombers, which actually is still extremely low. While I'm sure the writers of this movie were well-intentioned when they did this, by exaggerating the truth, they did no service to the actual Tuskegee Airmen because now that lie becomes a part of their legacy, one that they have to talk about. One of the most iconic scenes in Enemy at the Gates is when the Soviets are launching an attack over the Volga River during the Battle of Stalingrad. A Russian officer with a British accent yells to conscripts picking up rifles in front of him the famous line, the the point of this scene is to show the audience just how low on resources the Soviets were. They only had one rifle for every other man. So when a man with a rifle dies, the man following him with one clip of rifle ammunition is supposed to pick up that rifle and fight on. It's one of those half-truths that gets circulated a lot and then becomes widely accepted. Call of Duty, when it actually used to be a good game, even copies this iconic scene. Now, I understand this is the artist's attempt to show how little the Soviet Union cared about the individual soldier, and while that was more or less true, uh, events like having two soldiers share one rifle almost never happened. Besides, the actual Battle of Stalingrad was much worse than just men running around without rifles. We're talking about death by starvation, frostbite, mass executions, terrible hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and numerous cases of cannibalism. Maybe that's just not romantic enough for Hollywood, but in reality, the Battle of Stalingrad was probably one of the worst battles in human history. Over 1.1 million people died. Now, as an American, I love indulging in the whole we save the world kind of thing. As a matter of fact, I oftentimes remind British Ben of this. But the truth is, we Americans sometimes take credit for things we actually didn't do. 
One example of this is the movie U-571, which follows the story of a U.S. submarine crew that was able to capture a German U-boat and secure what's known as an Enigma machine. The Enigma machine was one of the main ways that the German military coded their secret messages. By breaking the code, the Allies were able to gain access to German communications and predict the movement of German troops. Now, the fact that the Allies had broken the code was such a huge secret that no one really found out about this until the information was declassified in 1970. Now, the biggest problem with this movie, U-571, is the fact that Americans had nothing to do with this event at all. You see, it was actually the British Royal Navy who captured the first Enigma machine with its cipher key intact. And to make things even worse, they did this before America even had joined the war. Although, in fairness, the actual captain of the HMS Bulldog, the British sub that this movie is actually based on, said he loved the film, and he understood why it had to be Americanized. And that's because British people can't be good guys in films. Okay, I'm joking. The studio actually thought that, uh, financially speaking, the movie would not be successful without American characters. I disagree. The other problem was one scene showed a U-boat crew mowing down survivors of a cargo ship they had just recently sunk. Being sailors themselves and terrified of the prospect of being stranded in the ocean, U-boat crews generally were well known for providing aid and helping people adrift in the ocean. But they were also known for attacking civilian cargo ships. But it wasn't until a U.S. fighter attacked the German U-boat flying a Red Cross flag and carrying wounded that the German High Command decided that German U-boats could not save stranded people at sea anymore. This was a rule generally adopted by navies on both sides, but oftentimes it was broken. All sailors fear being stranded in the ocean. I mention this part of the movie because I think it's important to note that, you know, as Americans, we oftentimes forget that a lot of German soldiers were just fighting for their country. Unfortunately, that country was being run by a crazy lunatic, but it doesn't mean that they were all evil or in the Nazi party. Guys, I love John Woo, and I love his films, but John Woo should never direct a serious war drama. He just has too much flair and a lack of control. And what you get when he directs a film is a weird war-slash-action film called Wind Talkers, with too much slow-mo, flips, and dubs. Also, Nick Cage stars in the film. And as usual, it's impossible to prevent him from going full Nick Cage. But at the core of the story is a very interesting story about how Navajo Indians served in the U.S. Marines as code talkers in the Pacific Theater. Navajo was a relatively obscure language and very difficult to learn. It was estimated only around 30 non-Navajo people understood the language. Therefore, it was a terrific language for a secret code, and it was never deciphered by the enemy. It was so effective that Navajo code talkers would be used during the Korean and Vietnam War as well. Now, the movie follows Nick Cage, a U.S. Marine designated as a bodyguard for one of the Code Talkers. And much of the tension in the film surrounds the idea that as the bodyguard of the Code Talker, it was his responsibility to not only protect his Navajo Code Talker, but also kill him should the enemy come close to capturing him. While this is definitely an interesting twist in the character relationship between these two individuals, and also gives Nicolas Cage an opportunity to go nuts, the real job of a Code Talker's bodyguard was to prevent friendly fire incidents from happening. Because apparently Navajo Indians were sometimes mistaken for Japanese soldiers. In reality, Navajo Code Talkers were so valuable that the U.S. military would never voluntarily kill one. Now lastly, we have to mention Saving Private Ryan. Spielberg's film set a new bar for World War II movies when it came out. Everything from the tanks to the uniforms were recreated with impressive accuracy. The opening D-Day scene on Omaha Beach featuring the U.S. Rangers is widely heralded as one of the most uncomfortably realistic portrayals of the Normandy invasion. Sure, the beach is a little bit too short in the movie and the concrete pillboxes are too large, but I've been told that this scene captures the feeling of D-Day better than any other movie. But the fictional story that follows it to save Matt Damon does have a lot of problems with it. To begin with, the Rangers squad sent on the mission is way too small to be sent behind enemy lines to find one of the small scattered groups of paratroopers. The movie kind of makes it seem like once the Allies took the beach at Normandy, the battle was more or less over for France. This was far from the truth. The Germans had over 50 divisions deployed in France, and it took the Allies several weeks to break out from the beach area. Some of the heaviest fighting of the Western Front would happen after D-Day. Another problem was the first town the Rangers journey to is Newville, but in order to get there from Omaha Beach, they would have to fight through the heavily defended town of Caratan. More realistically, if you're going to send a squad of Rangers to go save Ryan, they would be deployed from Utah Beach. 
Utah Beach was just a few miles from Newville. And the landing at this beach was a lot easier than at Omaha, and the Army had already linked up with many pockets of airborne troopers. At the end of the day, I do enjoy Saving Private Ryan. I enjoy most of the movies on this list, even Wind Talkers, a little bit. My only real problem with Saving Private Ryan is I don't think so many brave men would give their lives to save a dickhead like Matt Damon. Matt Damon. A few years later, Spielberg and Tom Hanks would go on to make Band of Brothers without Matt Damon, and it was one of my favorite war dramas of all time. It's also pretty realistic and entertaining at the same time. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and maybe you learned something interesting. Who knows? Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. My name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.